Sure, so I'm Kevin Kaur, and um, I've been doing both computer science and philosophy roughly since I was 16. I learned programming in high school, and um, the first philosopher I noticed in a serious way was Karl Popper. And he, his conjectures and refutations basically persuaded me to get into philosophy, and um, philosophy of science in particular, but that came a little bit later. I'm working at Monash University in what was a computer science department. It's been merged and remerged and is now simply called the Clayton School of IT. Um, but they have room for artificial intelligence research and machine learning research and, and those things are of interest to me. So the, the basic program is to implement philosophical theories of method in computer code. So you'll find around the world there are a small number of people interested in trying to do something like that. Like Paul Thagger wrote a book called Computational Philosophy of Science, which uh, uh, presents one approach towards doing that. I'm certainly a believer in, in computer programs as a vehicle for testing philosophical theories of method. So, so I'm engaged in that with a Bayesian flavor, of course. Falsificationism is the name commonly given to his, his theory of method. So his idea is that scientific method really is just uh, uh, conjectures on the one side, um, some sort of random positing of, of hypotheses and theories about what's going on in the world, and then severe testing in order to, to wean out those, uh, those theories, weed out those theories that uh, don't cut the muscle. That was a very popular theory, but I think it's fair to say that in philosophy of science, as of a few decades ago, it's pretty well died out. It has lots of problems, including um, a kind of obvious problem that you can't give a serious account of progress or accumulation of scientific knowledge if you have no scientific knowledge, if all you can do is say what's false. Well, I see falsificationism as being subsumed by Bayesianism. I think Bayesian accounts of severe testing are at least as plausible as Popper's account. Um, the basic idea is just that you look for alternative theories which give varying degrees of probability to some evidence you might be able to accumulate through an experiment. If they have highly variable likelihoods, then the likelihood ratio is going to be either very large or very small, meaning you either get high confirmation or high disconfirmation, and, and that's the way to go. In, in that way, you get a confirmation theory, which Popper couldn't give. You get a theory of how it is that hypotheses um, are, are justifiable confidence in some hypotheses increases and others decreases. And so I think Bayesianism, in fact, does everything that Popperianism does well, as well, and does other things better, like confirmation theory. So to put it in a nutshell, I guess, I think falsificationism has no real place in uh, philosophy of science today, except maybe as a kind of crude heuristic device that uh, in most cases would be better replaced by probabilistic reasoning. Well, I guess it depends a bit on what you mean by falsification. If you mean something very strict, then very little is falsifiable. Popper was a little bit hazy on the edges. I mean, he was, after all, a fallibilist, and, and he certainly agreed that um, even observation sentences can't be established with certainty. So if you take a very strict logical view of what falsification is, then, then it's never achievable, even, even in a Popperian view of methodology. Um, Bayesianism is much softer than that. Um, uh, okay, yeah, it's back to the demarcation criterion. What is scientific and what isn't? And Popper was very concerned with that question. And so he used the ability to falsify or the inability to falsify as, as a potential source of criticism for pseudoscientific endeavors like Marxism or religion or what have you. Um, I think that has a fair bit of merit. I think the demarcation question has kind of fallen out of favor in philosophy of science and not too many people 
are concerned about it. But um, it occurs to me, for example, that global warming denialism is really not falsifiable. Um, the evidence is, is pretty clear that they, whenever serious evidence is put to them that um, global warming is anthropogenic and, and real, um, they simply find some way of reinterpreting the evidence uh, to avoid rejection of their theories. That's just classic uh, kind of non-falsifiable, non-scientific behavior, and I think there's a point to criticizing that. Um, but on the whole, I'm not that concerned with demarcation or either demarcation issues. I'm more interested in getting a scientific method right and improving it and improving its practice. Well, I'm in favor of using heuristics and biases when they're effective, um, when they're effective at saving time and trouble and so on. I have no practical objection to it. Of course, it can be overdone. Um, orthodox, orthodox statistics would be the obvious candidate for looking for problems. Classical statistical significance testing ignores prior probabilities, intentionally ignores them, and, and is a shortcut. Um, if you're taking the results of that to be definitive, then you might be causing yourself some problems down the line. So I think Bayesian statistics has it well over orthodox statistics. But basically, the advantage orthodox statistics has had for a century is, is the computational advantage. Um, orthodox stats are really easy to compute. Uh, they're like table lookups and stuff like that, very easy. Um, Bayesian statistics, um, by and large, is very difficult. But with MCMC methods and things like that, and the computational power available on the desk, g given to us by Moore's Law, much enamored of by Kurzweil and company, um, Bayesian stats is really flourishing, and it's, that's bound to continue. So the opportunity to replace heuristic rules of thumb in orthodox statistical tests um, is real now, and, and in many cases should be opted for. Of course, I use statistic tests myself, frequently. Uh, because they're so simple and because we're all lazy, we all have only limited time. So, so I don't say they shouldn't be used, I just say they should be used with caution. If you take machine learning and AI in general, um, up to uh, 1990, um, all kinds of statistics were ignored. People would run their little machine learning programs and, uh, and perform no statistical tests of any kind and declare one a winner over the other if they had a better one-shot performance. For example, there's, um, there's a technical report out of Carnegie Mellon. Um, lead author was Sebastian Thrun, in which uh, he, around 1990, tested uh, 30 or something algorithms against the then existing UC Irvine machine learning database uh, which included various flavors of neural networks and uh, decision tree learners and so on. And, and, and he, they, there were 30 authors or something. They declared winners and losers for each particular domain um, on the basis of a sample size of one. And that was statistical sophistication in 1990 in the AI community. Things have come a lot farther than that now. Nowadays, people actually know about confidence intervals and, and serious statistical significance tests, and they do that. But by and large, in the AI community, they're still using orthodox statistics. They're not using Bayesian statistics. And, and there are problems because of that. That's an excellent question. I hope you don't expect me to answer that within the course of this uh, talk. Um, in a serious way. In a less serious way, f first of all, Occam's razor precedes Bayesian reasoning by um, more than a few centuries. William of Occam uh, came up with this as a metaphysician, not as a methodologist. And, and, and the kind of thinking there certainly applies before, or can apply, before you, you think about Bayesian inference. Basically, the idea of Occam's razor is that unless you're forced to um, a more complex position, a simpler one should be preferred. 
and, and that's not necessarily based on probabilistic ideas. It's maybe based on, um, uh, say, human cognitive capacity. There's only so much cognizing we can do about any given problem. And if we don't start out simpler and, com and complexify only in the face of necessity, then, uh, then we're going to find, we're going to make life a lot more difficult for ourselves. Um, but your question is really, I suppose, are simpler theories more probable than more complex theories? And of course, in some cases that's true, and in other cases it's false. Is it true as a rule? Is it a rule that we can rely upon? Well, not exactly. Um, some very complex theories have been well tested and well confirmed, and they have a high posterior probability. I suppose the, the more likely question is, did they have a high prior probability? And the answer is probably not. Um, but rather than give a straightforward answer, which is difficult, it's a difficult problem, a difficult area, I'll give an, a less direct alluding answer. I'll allude to Chris Wallace. He's the foundation, was the foundation professor of computer science here at Monash University. And he invented, developed a method called minimum message length inference, a uh, information theoretic form of Bayesianism. And in that method, you have um, codes, if you like, to code both hypotheses, joint spaces of hypotheses and evidence. And in order to work that system, you have to have a code for prior, the space of hypotheses, and which yields a prior probability for each hypothesis. His default position was to develop a code book which in some sense rewards simplicity, so that simpler theories are by default more probable than more complex theories. The advantage to that is basically that, that by forcing um, a preference for simpler theories, then you, as you accumulate evidence, as the evidence goes against the simpler theories, you get the posterior distribution gets driven away from the simpler theories towards those more complex theories that are doing a better job with the evidence acquired. And so the evidence slowly pushes the interest, the confidence, towards that area of the hypothesis space, which is doing the best job with the evidence, and with a continued bias towards the simpler side of those hypotheses. So the, the long-term result, I think, is a lot like Hans Reichenbach's vindication of induction, that, that by that technique, you can end up on the truth. Alternatives tend not to make a lot of sense. If you reward in, in your prior probability distribution more complex hypotheses, then it's very hard for evidence to drive you from more complex to simpler. Furthermore, most hypothesis spaces are infinite, and you can't really reward complexity over simplicity in a systematic way. You have to give up somewhere. You can't distribute a probability mass over infinity in some kind of uniform distribution or anything that doesn't, in fact, reward simplicity. So, so Wallace's methods work. They work really well. They're nevertheless consistent with an informed prior distribution that is rewarding what, whatever beliefs we may have acquired from evolution or elsewhere about, um, about the hypothesis space. So if complexity is for some reason to be rewarded initially, say because of evolution, then minimum message length inference can, uh, can accommodate that. So anyway, I think it's a, a very promising, very useful way of implementing Bayesian ideas in, uh, in actual computational methods. Scaling is really hard. <laughs> Scaling means things like when you go from a problem with three variables to one with 30,000, um, can your algorithm still work? I think the, the main techniques for scaling have to do with approximate inference and stochastic sampling and things like that. Um, but it's just tough. It's tough. We scale really well, humans, I mean. Our computer programs don't scale so well. Not yet. Maybe someday. Quantum computing might be an answer to some of those problems. 
it's all a lot slower than people would like. Yeah. Yep, there aren't any instant answers. Um, I don't really know a great, I don't know much of anything about quantum computing really, but for me, the if I were to pursue it, I think the more most immediate question would be, how do you program the things to do anything interesting? I haven't heard of any answers. Software is, is always the problem. Huh? As I put in my article on the singularity, I think software is the thing that is really making scaling difficult and will continue to do so for some time to come. I have little sympathy for extremists of any persuasion. Um, AI, for example, in the 80s was split, multi-way split between logicists slash symbolicists and connectionists and evolution algorithm enthusiasts and so on. Um, everybody's saying that their technique and their technique alone would be the winner and artificial intelligence depends upon it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I just have no time for ideologues, basically. I think that they're um, they, they damage the science, they damage the technology, they waste a lot of time, they cause a lot of trouble. And I'd... Okay, there, there, there's value in it as well. Any given theory really does need to be pushed to its limits to find out what those limits are. So, so in some sense, I have no objection to it, but, but when they start withholding funding from, from competing schools of thought, it's basically the exclusivity claims that I really um, have a hard time abiding. So, to your particular question, are we going to learn from neuroscience? Of course we're going to learn from neuroscience. Is that going to be the, the one and only answer to generating an artificial intelligence? Perhaps, but uh, if so, then that would be probably to the detriment of AI. Um, I think that um, neuroscientific, cognitive science, psychology, um, Bayesianism, evolutionary methods, all of these things have things, ha have ideas, important ideas to contribute. And we don't need some sort of exclusionary principle. Mm -hmm.